Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming again. Uh, in this second session, I want to be more focused uh, than I was last time, and I apologize. I was probably not as disciplined as I should be in terms of uh, having a reasonable number of slides. But last time, I spent a fair bit of the time talking about why to estimate the value of ecosystem services and biodiversity. Today, I'd like to concentrate somewhat more narrowly on how to do this. Uh, last time I gave the example of bioprospecting and I calibrated this simple model to estimate a bound on the potential values of wild biodiversity for use in the search for new products. Now, one of the things that may have been occurring to you as economists is, well, why did I take a, a strictly modeling approach as opposed to a more econometric approach? Why not say that this is a production function and that we could estimate the production function using information on the inputs. The inputs in this case would be the cost of doing pharmaceutical research and the species that were available to do it. Well, a couple of reasons for not doing it in this context. One is that the number of species in the world is essentially available to everyone. So it's not clear what the variation is. Um, and there'd be some difficult issues of trying to define exactly what the production or what should go into the production process. So I use a simplified model instead. In other settings though, econometric approaches might be used. And I'd like to talk a little bit today about comparing and contrasting econometric approaches to the valuation of biodiversity and ecosystem services to uh, more modeling based approaches. And then think a little bit about which approach might be better in which circumstances. I'm going to try to go through several examples today. I sort of doubt that I'll get through all of them, but just to give you a preview, I'm going to talk about some things that are fairly frequently referred to in the literature on ecosystem service values, biodiversity values. These things are waste treatment values. What are natural ecosystems worth in terms of their ability to prevent wastes from entering into for example, uh, pristine waters, waters we want to drink from, et cetera. Uh, I'm also going to talk about coastal flood protection, coastal storm protection. I'm going to talk about pollination, uh, if uh, time permits in this, in this lecture. And if time doesn't permit this time, I'll probably talk about it next time. And then uh, if we have some time left over, I'll talk about ecotourism as well. Oh, and then just one thing I skipped over a little too quickly there is another question that we're going to want to think about is how detailed should models be? We can talk about doing econometric models. We can talk about doing theoretical models and simulations and calibrations. How detailed should they be? So let's start off with pollution treatment. And one of the first of the benefits of natural, diverse natural ecosystem services that economists tried to estimate was the value of largely forest and wetland areas to treat pollutants and prevent sedimentation. So John Dixon during his time at the World Bank did work on, on how forests prevented sedimentation of hydroelectric and irrigation reservoirs. Uh, there is some important work done on the use of wetlands in the United States for treatment of pollutants. And then there's been a lot of work on, for example, the wetlands in the vicinity. I believe this, I hope I have the right picture here. I believe this is the vicinity of Kampala, Uganda, where the wetlands are famously uh, effective in treating pollutants that come out of the city's sewage system. And then there's other areas of the world as well, including India in which the wetlands and forest ecosystems are preserved to provide these services. Uh, let's take a little bit about how this works. I am not familiar, does anybody know this town? Uh, and maybe it's famous, uh, but you can, <laughs> I've been uh, cheating and going online for a few photographs, but uh, there are a number of places around the world where you see this phenomena of rivers merging. And as you can see, one river is more heavily laden with sediment, sediment than is the other. Uh, this may, I don't really know, this is uh, maybe 100, 200 kilometers east of Dehradun, I believe. Anyway, given its setting, I would imagine sources of sediment were glacial as well as, as forest landscape. But the idea would be that you might reduce the sediment load in perhaps the more sediment laden of those streams 
by maintaining forest to intercept sediment as it came off hillsides. Uh, there's been a lot of work on these topics in, natural, in the natural sciences. There have been so-called paired watershed studies, which look at one watershed with more forest cover or other vegetation cover, compare it to another watershed with less, and see how much, uh, what the effects are, often on several things, sediment transport, uh, treatment of pollution, um, recharge of groundwater, et cetera. So a lot of work done. With these sort of studies. And then there's a lot of work in the natural science literature on the effects of areas of, of forest or wetlands on reducing pollutants or reducing sediment. Um, these particular studies I'm referring to here are on the use of so-called riparian buffers, largely forest areas maintained along the sides of streams and reducing the flow of sediment and, and, uh, and pollutants to those streams. And I'll just note in passing here, that these studies often adopt an exponential decay uh, depiction of how the, the vegetated area reduces flows. Now, I wanted to talk about this example because this is a case in which we have some good examples of econometric studies. Uh, one good one is paper published by Jeff Vincent and several colleagues in 2016, I believe it's in Environmental and Resource Economics. And they considered water treatment costs in Malaysia. Let's take a quick step back or quick step to the side maybe. Why is it that we care about sediment transport in terms of economic values? Well, we care about sediment transport in terms of economic values to the extent that, that the existence of excess sediment in the water may affect human well-being. How might that be? Well, we don't like to have a lot of sediment in our drinking water. So if we don't like to have a lot of sediment in our drinking water, we pay, we incur costs in pollution treatment plants to remove the sediment. The more sediment in the water, the higher, higher the cost. So Vincent et al. looked at water treatment costs in Malaysia as a function of the amount of sediment in the water, and then the amount of sediment in the water as a function of the maintenance of upstream forested areas. Hmm? Just one, because you've done this work that sedimentation also reduces the, the life of reservoirs, right? Mm -hmm. Because they... They fill up. So I think in India, that's a big concern. If I think people hear, okay, yeah. know about it. So the the lifetime of dams and things get shortened because mm -hmm. they fill up very fast. Right? Yes, that's that's true. It's an interesting case. If anybody is interested in that example, I'd like to talk with you about it afterwards because I think this. Yeah, maybe it's that time. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to go through it here because I'm going to <laughs> zip through to get to other stuff. But again, if anybody's interested in reservoir, uh, both on the hydroelectric aspects of it and the uh, ecological economics aspect of it, I'd be very interested in talking with you afterwards. But Vincent and his colleagues did a study of forested areas in Malaysia. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I don't remember exactly what province this was, but it's province in Malaysia. And you have a map here showing the various land uses. And Vincent and his colleagues were looking at how land uses and particularly forest cover affected the water treatment plant costs. Uh, so uh, I've just gone through the intermediate points there, but they took advantage of an extensive panel data set they had on treatment costs as well as the condition of forests. Panel data means, of course, that they had observations on the same areas or on a number of different areas over a number of different time periods. So they could compare cross-sectionally one watershed that is more deforested than it is another. And they could also compare longitudinally as forest cover declines over time, what happens to the sediment load in that area. Uh, they estimated a regression expression of this form, log of the cost uh, of treatment plant I at time T was a function of the log of this expression, A sub I T is total area of the watershed in which the treatment plant are draining to the treatment plant. F I T necessarily less than A I T is the area of force that's maintained in that watershed. The other variables were a variety of other factors particular to the watershed and the time. Uh, importantly among them, the flow rate determined by rainfall uh, of water coming. Doggone it. <laughs> I didn't even touch it that time. Back, back. Okay. <laughs> 
the X <laughs> there's other variables. Again, importantly, the flow rate, fixed effects. Again, this is panel data set that, and by using fixed effects, they were able to eliminate factors that were invariant over the particular watershed and over time periods. And then a random disturbance term, as is usually the case in an econometric is there estimate. A subscript on A, or is just A, I, I'm sorry. Uh, actually, no, there should not be a time sub. There should not be a time subscript on that because the area of the watershed is invariant and determined by geological factors, not biological. Okay, so this is yes. I'm sorry. Yes, exactly right. So we want to know variations both between areas at the same time how those variations affect the cost of water treatment, and then variations within the same area over time periods might affect the cost of water treatment. So just to, to clarify, given a certain amount of rainfall, you know, if we're controlling for the amount of rainfall, if we're controlling for other factors such as price inputs that might go into the determination of the cost of water treatment, then we wanna know, we're not necessarily observing directly the sediment flow here, but we want to know how the forest cover might be affecting the generation of sediment that's then going to increase the cost of treatment. Can you all hear me back there? <laughs> okay, if you want to move forward, please can you, do. Can you come up, please? There's a lot of space. Uh, David, sorry, just a clarification question. I mean, this uh, way that it's been written, mm -hmm. wouldn't one just intuitively think of the fraction of the Basin that's under forest. So, that's yeah. Why, so, so, this is exactly right. And in fact, if you look at the paper, what Vincent and his colleagues did was this expression, I believe, was the inverse of one plus F over A. So, as Professor Gupta says, you would want to think in terms of the fraction. But then they did an interesting correction. And I'm going to come back to this momentarily. They made it because the log of, of zero is infinitely negative. They had to take account of what's gonna happen in the limit as the area of forest declines to nothing in the area of the watershed. And so what they did there was they arbitrarily added a one. Uh, so we're gonna see if that may affect the, some of the results they get. But let's just say for, for present purposes, this is the expression that Vincent and his colleagues estimated. When they did this, uh, they came up with a result that basically said that, as we might expect, the marginal value is high only in circumstances in which the area of forest is low. So this is, remember last time I was emphasizing the importance of the diamonds and water paradox, and this is just simply that again. If you don't have a lot of forest area providing the treatment, then maybe the marginal product of the forest area in providing the sediment uh, control treatment can be fairly high. So relatively speaking, when forest areas were low, they got at least a range of some of the higher values of their estimates of the marginal uh, avoided costs of forest area treatment. And then conversely is the area of forest within the the basin drained by a watershed got to be very high. The marginal value of additional forests in those very large watersheds uh, declined to, to essentially zero. And then this is the expression they get because of the log on log form. The change in expected cost with respect to forest areas inversely is directly proportional to expected costs and inversely proportional to the area of forest as well as the area of the watershed. Uh, I should say, um, let's see, I should have reminded myself exactly what the results were. I'm not sure if it's coming up in another slide or I may have skipped over it. So let me just say now, uh, while they did get significant effects and they did find that relative to the cost of operation of treatment plants, the marginal benefit of forest area was relatively large. Again, relative to the cost of operating the treatment plant, the marginal value of additional forest area was not high enough to justify the preservation of forest areas on its own in their findings. So again, this is a quick summary of their findings. I wanna uh, point out one thing though that we're gonna come back to, I think it's gonna be a very important concern, is when Vincent and his colleagues did this work, 
one of the variables on the right hand side of the equation was the volume of water treated. Makes sense that other things being equal, if you're treating more water, it's going to be more expensive to treat it. Now, this raises an interesting question. If the volume of water is very high and it's expensive to treat it, then perhaps you, as the operator of the plant, would decide if I'm getting a lot of water coming down the river system, I'm not going to treat to the same level. So one of the things Vincent and his colleagues did was said, let's consider the possibility that the quantity of water treated on the right-hand side of the equation is an endogenous variable. And we're going to instrument, use instrumental variables. Instrumental variables, everybody. Instrumental variables, raise hand if familiar. Uh, <laughs> raise hand if not. Okay, take a good econometrics course. <laughs> I don't think I've got, don't think I have time to explain in, in, in detail, but you have to have some source of variation which is independent. How do I want to say this? You have to have a source of variation explaining the right hand side variables that is independent of the, the sources of variation explaining the left-hand side variables. You can't have the same, um, same unmeasured phenomenon affecting both the independent and the dependent variables. How'd I do on that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm gonna explain how I do this stuff without doing a lot of econometrics. So this is not my strong point, but the point I do wanna make here is Vincent and his colleagues thought it was important to consider endogeneity. The possibility that the quantity was determined by choices of plant operators. They used instrumental variables. They lagged um, lagged the water flow uh, a couple of periods and found that uh, the instrument appeared to be effective, but didn't really make a lot of difference in the estimates. And I think this is probably worth thinking about. Uh, those of you who have had econometrics courses, um, I'm just trying to think of a couple of good examples. It's, it's maybe I'm dating myself here a bit, but when I was taking econometrics courses in the 1980s, there was a lot of emphasis on estimating cost functions and production functions for regulated utilities. The reason for that was the quantity that the regulated utility was required to produce was determined by the regulatory authority, and therefore the utility could not decide to to produce a different quantity in response to, to things that were also affecting its costs. So again, this is important in this context. What Vincent and his colleagues wanted to know was how would deforestation affect the cost of cleaning water? And if people decided in response to deforestation, we're not going to clean water, then you're not gonna get a very good estimate of the effect on the cost. Okay, but the reason I wanted to emphasize this is I think that the Vincent et al. study is usefully illustrative when we're thinking about the value of biodiversity and ecosystem services for a couple of reasons. One is what I just said, that if you have something like a water treatment plant in which you, you are required by regulation to produce a certain level of water treatment, then you don't have the endogeneity concern of people changing or plant operators changing their behavior in response to, to things that also affect the, the amount of sediment that's coming. The other thing that's going to be important is Vincent and his, his co-author's example is interesting because in ecological economic terms, it's sort of a case of action at a distance. You have a treatment plant down here at the base of a watershed where a river is perhaps coming to a large city, but then clear up in the mountains or foothills, you've got the deforestation going on. And so the factors that affect the treatment plant are not or are likely to be independent of the factors that determine the degree of deforestation upstream. Now, that's going to be important because when we think about other ecosystem services, often we're thinking about things that are side by side. We have, as we'll see in the next example, a situation in which people build their homes right adjacent to 
an area of forest that they may be maintaining, the area of coastal forest they may be maintaining in order to prevent a, a, a storm damage. Or when we talk about the case of pollination, I think pollination is really interesting example from this perspective, because what we're really asking is how much ostensibly identical land might a farmer wish to set aside for maintaining pollinators as opposed to using for, using for growing her crops. So again, these, these issues of endogeneity are, are going to be uh, important when we, as we talk about them. Um, I always think as the seminal paper on these issues being worked by Elena Irwin and Nancy Boxtel, I guess Elena would have been after your time at Maryland. Yeah, Elena was a, a student of Nancy, so, so uh, one of uh, Professor Gupta's uh, distinguished followers was, uh, was uh, the co-author of this paper. And what they looked at was, was exactly this question I described, is how do people set aside land for the provision of values uh, created by the set aside land for areas that are developed? And then the question here, and this gets us sort of to the modern or what I think of as the recent develops, developments in econometrics is how are we gonna find adequate instrumental variables or natural experiments? By natural experiments, I mean some source of exogenous change in the condition of the landscape that can't be related to the value of converted land, but does explain why an area of forest might be maintained, for example. So this has been a major challenge in the empirical literature in recent years. Uh, I took this paper from a, or sorry, took this quote from a recent paper by Zip et al. It basically says the existing econometric literature investigating the effect of conservation on nearby, nearby development has not fully examined or found a solution to the endogeneity of land conservation. So again, let's, let's be clear on what the problem is. The problem is that we are interested in how the area of natural habitat preserved affects the value of production or the value of use in adjoining land. And the statistical problem is that the same un potentially unobserved factors are determining both the value of farmland, for example, and the decision of whether or not to convert surrounding forest to farmland. So just to give a, a I guess, or just to underscore that implication, value of farmland is likely to be low in areas that have not yet been, or in areas in which large portions of the surrounding forest have not yet been converted to farms. So the same factors might be explaining both why the, why the value of production is relatively low and the forest around, in, around it remains standing. So if we just do simple OLS estimation, for example, we're not going to come up with an accurate estimate of the value of the forest land for, for farms. Uh, let me also just mention a, in passing an analogous concept here. Uh, I think of this work as being Paul Ferraro, Alex Pfaff, um, I believe the first author was, I can't remember first name, Andam. Anyway, um, there have been a series of papers on the, the effectiveness of protected areas. And I raise this as an example because I think it's just sort of the, the opposite side of the coin. With protected areas, we have essentially two hypotheses. The first is, saying that an area is protected, saying that something is a national park or wildlife reserve means that it's going to be protected and it's going to remain in forests. It's going to remain, it's going to retain its natural biota, even though that forest and biota is being lost in areas around it. So that's hypothesis one, is that designating something as protected is actually effective. Hypothesis number two, is that governments designate protected areas in order to look like they're doing something when they're not really doing anything. So hypothesis number two is areas that are protected are areas that aren't really at any risk of conversion in the first place. 
So in order to know whether or not protected areas are doing a good job, we would have to have some way of exogenously explaining why it is that some areas were designated for protection and some weren't. We would have to have some way of distinguishing between the hypotheses that this land really wasn't valuable anyway, and therefore it was protected because the cost of doing so was low, and the hypothesis that there was actually a conscious effort made to maintain those areas. The way Andam et al. did it was they uh, used a matching study. So they took found parcels of land that were otherwise as identical as they could possibly make them or possibly find them. And they say, okay, we're gonna match this parcel, which was designated with, for protection, which looks otherwise very similar to this parcel that was not designated for protection. And then we're gonna see whether or not just the designation of protection seems to result in the, in the parcel that was designated for protection being in better shape. The somewhat disappointing result of this undertaking was that they found that the nominal designation for protection didn't seem to have a very great effect. So they're finding that on. on conservation, they were finding that, again, the question is, would you have to think about the counterfactual, would this parcel of land look a lot worse if it had not been designated for protection? Well, what Andam and their colleagues found was, well, it looks pretty good whether or not it's designated for protection. The reason for that is the government pretty much said, okay, we are going to declare as park areas all the lands nobody really wants to do anything with anyway. So, so is uh, some sort of difference in the difference where they are uh, no, this well, this is a, a matching. So they, they did a propensity score match and said, let's find two parcels that seem to be otherwise identical and we'll try to, to do a match. And then we'll just compare it. Uh, what, what was the criteria to choose? That, for, for the matching? Yes. That I couldn't tell you, I'm afraid I don't remember. Uh, that I would have to look up to. <laughs> yeah, I think so. But, uh, so similar kind of studies could also be uh, sort of estimated in the history of India. For example, uh, for example, in India, suppose there is a legislation mm -hmm. to save tiger reserves. Mm -hmm. So uh, some states may adopt the legislation earlier and some may adopt it later. So yeah. we have the exogenous variation. That the uh, original experiment you are talking about is mm -hmm. that this uh, spread out rollout of this legislation may bring the uh, exogenous variation. Yeah. Did everybody hear that? I think that's a, a really good point. And in fact, I I agree. And my sense is, and maybe others have a better idea, but my sense is that this sort of regression discontinuity approach is would be what I would describe what you're talking about has not been exploited as well as it might be in thinking about estimating ecosystem service values. If we could find situations in which there was truly exogenous variation in the designation of areas for, protect, for protection, if in effect the government had flipped a coin and said, okay, this area is designated for protection and this area on the other side is not designated for protection or <laughs> stuff is falling all over the place. Uh, anyway, uh, if the government had in effect flipped a coin and had truly exogenously determined which areas were going to be preserved and which weren't, then it would be a clean test of this. I think the problem is too often we just don't have that sort of, of exogenous determination of which parts of the landscape have been, have been preserved. And if we don't have that exogenous determination, we can't, we can't without having good instruments or some other alternative come up with good estimates of the values. So uh, again, while Vincent and his colleagues found, go, sorry, slipping back from this digression, talking about exogeneity and so forth, they find statistically significant benefits of, in terms of avoiding cost to increase forest cover. 
However, they found that those benefits are rather small compared to the opportunity cost of other forest uses. That is, they could not make a compelling argument based on their evidence that the water treatment values were in and of themselves going to be enough to uh, induce conservation. However, they had a couple of other arguments. I guess I'll go with the second one first and, and just say quickly, they said, well, we didn't measure everything. And that's always going to be the case. Didn't measure everything. Who knows what other values might be there. But I'd also like to think about the attenuation bias issue. So attenuation bias is just the idea that if you mismeasure the variables on the right-hand side of your equation, you introduce a bias. And not only that, the bias is always to, to make your estimated coefficients closer to zero, to make your coefficients less significant. So there are a variety of reasons for which this attenuation bias might have arisen with the Vincent et al. paper. I'd like to focus on a couple of them. One is that they discussed only, or they measured only the area of forest in the basin, which was presumably providing the water treatment service. Now, if you think about it, area of forest within a basin could provide this water treatment service in at least two different ways. One is simply by displacing other activities that would lead to more cleared land. Now there's extensive scientific information saying that cleared lands experience far more erosion in the event of rainfall than do this land with forests on it. I think that makes intuitive sense that if you've got more roots and trees in the land, less of the soil is gonna be carried away. So one aspect of having a higher forest area is just that you're gonna be generating less sediment that could end up downstream. The other aspect though, is that in addition to providing that service, if we had, let me do another one of my with my hands illustrations. If we had an area of forest up here, and then an area of farm that had been cleared uh, down the hill slope. And again, the farmed area is going to experience more erosion. But then another area of forest down at the bottom, then the area of forest down at the bottom is having two services. It is displacing farmland that otherwise would have produced more erosion. But it's also, and the scientific literature I think is pretty straightforward on this, it's also intercepting and retaining some of the sediments that are coming from uphill. So part of the attenuation bias, part of the mismeasurement that's sort of unavoidable in a study like this, but part of the mismeasurement problem is going to be simply that they didn't have detailed information on where in the topography of the location, uh, the forests were located. So I think they do have a, a good point here that the attenuation bias may have made the, the estimates somewhat smaller. Um, let me contrast what Vincent et al. did. And I say one more thing. You remember, I believe Professor Gupta asked the question about the A and the F in that logarithmic expression. And I explained that Vincent and his co-authors in order to avoid a logarithm of zero, arbitrarily added one. Well, that led to a specification, which if you also think about it, necessarily limited the value of the deforestation variable between one and two, and therefore the value of its log between zero and uh, 0.69 something or other, if I remember the log of two correctly. So anyway, they were limiting the range of, of an important right-hand side variable. So let's think about another way in which we might think of or might approach the problem of treatment services of watershed. Remember I remarked from a couple of slides back that a lot of the natural science literature has, has treated, or let's be redundant here, a lot of the natural science literature has treated the water treatment service as an exponentially declining function of the area providing that treatment service. Let's just think quickly about how that could arise naturally enough in practice. Let's suppose we have, and I gotta stand away from it so I don't accidentally tweak it, but let's suppose that brown area is, as I was saying earlier, it might be a, an area that's been cleared for farming and therefore is gonna be a source of large amounts of erosion. Then let's suppose we have these successive strips of green area are 
let's say an additional meter, another additional meter, another additional meter of riparian buffer of trees being maintained to intercept the over surface flow of the sediment laden, laden water. And then what we care about is we want to prevent the sediment which is coming from the uphill area from enter, entering a ecologically and socially important receptor area. In the Vincent et al example, we wanted to prevent that flow of sediment and we wanted to at least reduce the flow of sediment so it's not increasing the costs of water treatment. Well, if we suppose that a fraction, a, the same fraction, let's call it rho, of the total flow is filtered out through every meter of the buffer of the vegetated strip through which the, the uh, flow of water passes, then we're basically talking about an exponentially declining function. First, uh, after the first meter of riparian buffer, a fraction one minus rho of what you started with is left. After the second meter, one minus rho squared, et cetera, et cetera, let rho go to zero uh, or let rho be a small number, let the number of sequential strips go to infinity or go to, a, well, it doesn't have to go to infinity, go to a relatively large number. We're talking about an exponential approximation here. So let's suppose that we, instead of using Vincent's function, um, suppose that there was exponential decline in the transport of sediment or other pollutants in water. And incidentally, as I said in passing, um, this is an assumption that is made frequently and has been uh, verified in a lot of the hydrological and ecological literature. So let's suppose that the cost of treating water to a specified standard is just a function of the amount of the original load that remains after it's been declining exponentially at rate rho through a buffer of width w. Uh, let's suppose that we're talking about a situation in which a buffer is maintained at a constant width along a stream, which in all the areas upstream of, of this buffer have a, a constant flow of pollutants coming down, which then would be in the pollution load per linear meter of the stream is the same. And the marginal value of an extra meter of buffer would just be determined by differentiating that cost expression. So it's the marginal cost of treating another unit of the pollutant we're concerned about times its expression rho times the load that that is is coming down so i used uh, this simple model and be interested in seeing how how or whether my approach would, would make much of a difference to Vincent et al's analysis of the data. But I use a simple model or, or this simple model and analysis of treatment of water pollution in the Chesapeake Bay watershed in the United States. Um, my home in Northern Virginia is right about there. Chesapeake Bay watershed is the darker area indicated by indicated sort of the shaded area there. Uh, there is concern that Chesapeake Bay is suffering from eutrophication, too many nutrients coming down, resulting in algal blooms, resulting in depletion of oxygen in the water. So uh, is an interest in, in how effective could riparian buffers be in treating that nutrient flow. Um, just incidentally, the pollutant of interest here was largely reactive nitrogen, not sediment. Um, we could talk about the biochemistry of reactive nitrogen, but I won't. But uh, there's, there's some interesting issues in, in its treatment too. But let's just say that the scientific literature provides a number of estimates of the effectiveness of riparian buffers in, in removing and treating reactive nitrogen. Now, the interesting thing in, in this area, I was able to find estimates of of the parameter, I called it rho, but it's referred to in the literature as removal rate, the fraction of the, the nitrogen load that's removed, and it's relatively low. One, two, three percent of the nitrogen load is reduced per meter of watershed that, uh, that or sorry, per meter of buffer that the flow traverses. Now think to yourself for a moment, what does it mean, or what's it likely to mean for the value of riparian buffer? 
what's it likely to mean for the extent of the riparian buffer that removal rate is so low? In other areas of the US, removal rates as high as 10% and more have been estimated that with, uh, with meter or with buffers as narrow as 10 meters, you might be able to remove substantially all of the nutrients flowing through an area. I found removal rates were a lot lower. I think people's, people's initial reaction to that must mean or may mean people's initial reaction to that may be that, oh, it's not very effective at removing the nutrients. Therefore, it must not be worth very much. Therefore, you wouldn't want to set aside too much. Actually, the opposite may be true. So going through this example, and I had a great thing about the US is you have plentiful mapping data. So I had the stream density, I had the value of agricultural land in the watershed. I had nitrogen loading from uh, animal waste as well as fertilizer applications in these areas. And then critically importantly, I had the opportunity cost of alternative means of reducing nitrogen loading by increasing the stringency of sewage treatment plants. So the idea here is the benefit that could be achieved by maintaining larger riparian buffers would be the cost at which uh, the farmer maintaining them, for example, could sell their nitrogen treating capacity to sewage treatment plants that needed to meet a regulatory standard. The riparian buffer is forest, right? Yes. Forest use. Mm -hmm. It can be any type of forest. Uh, it's usually considered to be native species. It's an interesting question as to whether it might be more effective if planted with exotics. But usually it's just paying farmers not to farm on a particular width of land uh, near a, a stream. Okay, so I said, I'm able to calibrate this model. I, I sort of gave you the, the intuition about, well, is this low removal rate going to mean that, that uh, we're not gonna have a very high value. We're not gonna have devote a lot of land to riparian buffers. Actually, in this case, it was reverse. That fairly generous riparian buffers could be justified. 2% removal rate means two things. Remember, think about that expression I had for the value of the marginal meter of riparian buffer depended on the cost, the implied cost of a ton of nitrogen or kilogram of nitrogen, I guess, and $35 of kilogram of nitrogen. So what a sewage treatment plant would be willing to pay a farmer to maintain another meter of buffer. Okay, so a low value means that this, that last meter buffer isn't reducing a lot of the flow, but a low value of the removal rate means there's still a lot of the pollution to be removed. And in this case, the, the interaction between those factors meant that you could potentially maintain fairly wide buffers. And in fact, in this case, and I'm not necessarily gonna say that this is uh, the absolute truth, but I estimated that perhaps as much as a third of the Chesapeake Bay watershed ought optimally, or optimally is a strong word, well, ought under certain, circ or under current circumstances, to be dedicated to riparian buffers rather than being used as largely chicken and cattle farms, dairy farms, which is the current use. So buffers might be, uh, might be justified for a third of the basin. And as I will say that I think a lot of my work has, has argued that, the, that ecosystem service values may not justify a lot of conservation. In this case, I think you could make a reasonable argument that you could justify more conservation. As I said before, the strange thing is, or maybe the thing that seems a little counterintuitive, is if the buffers were more effective, if each meter of buffer were more effective in removing pollution, it might be optimal to set less of the land aside for the pollution treatment service. Because again, if each meter reduces a lot of the pollution flow, there simply isn't much flow left the marginal meter to tree. Uh, it, it, hmm? uh, I, I was trying to understand the load is exogenous. I mean, the treating the load is exogenous. That's a good point. They basically saying that farmers are going to apply nitrogen fertilizer to the land, and 
actually, if you don't mind, I'm going to use that as a segue to my last point here, is that Professor Gupta's point is a good one here, that I am treating the farmer's loads or the, the amount of nitrogen pollution farmers produce is an exogenous variable or something that isn't necessarily determined by regulation. Or, well, it's some, something that they can go ahead and do without regard to, to how much of the land is being set aside as buffers. And this is a consequence of US environmental and agricultural policy. The United States Environmental Protection Agency, like environmental ministries in many areas of the world, has no authority to regulate pollution from farms. So, and not only that, it's even worse, as is also the case in much of the world, farmers get subsidies for many of their fertilizers, as well as subsidies on some of the feed that they give to their cattle and other livestock. So part of the problem here is that the value of these buffers may be high, in part because the loads are high. Now, if, if the United States were a rational society, we probably would be, have, we'd be uh, militating less for larger buffers and more for less pollution from our farms and less stupid subsidies to our farmers. If the United States were a rational society, however, Donald J. Trump would still be hosting a game show. So, I think we could dismiss that possibility. But yes, this is a consequence of the value of the ecosystem services may be higher because the ability to rationally regulate elsewhere in the landscape is lower. Our ability to control pollution from farms is lower. Sorry, so this is just an observation that I mean, if you, when you go back to the resources for the future of the old days, mm -hmm. They used to have these big models of mm -hmm. the Chesapeake Bay. Mm -hmm. My point is that a lot of things are endogenous, the, the profitability of the farming mm -hmm. and things like that. So, I mean, it would, again, I don't know enough about the farming systems, but uh, conceivably demand and supply could uh, determine or not. Exactly. Yeah, you know, that's a really interesting point. Obviously, if we're talking about taking up a third of the land in the watershed, we would be talking about having some fairly substantial impact on the production in the region. Now, whether or not that would be enough substantially to affect the price of farm output and farm inputs in the region, I think that's, that's a reasonable question. So just to restate the question, I am assuming basically that the opportunity costs of farmers of foregoing an acre of land or hectare of land, I guess I was uh, using in this case, remains the same at about 12,000 US dollars per hectare. If we got into general equilibrium effects by reducing the volume of agricultural production substantially, then the, that opportunity cost might go up and it might be the case that less, less land set aside might be justified. Um, as I would say, I think within the context of US agriculture, particularly US production and transportation systems, it's likely that enough could be brought in from other parts of the country to make up for it. But then again, if we're talking about instituting rational farm policy and environmental policy, the problems of the Chesapeake are just a microcosm of the problems in the Mississippi Valley, Mississippi, Missouri, Ohio, system that drains the entire center of the country and is creating large pollution problems in the Gulf of Mexico. So yes, if we had a much more universally rational policy, then we'd have to revisit these figures. But let's just say, as currently constituted, I think there's a pretty good argument to be made for, yes, we should at least be encouraging larger riparian buffer zones in order to control pollution in, in, in agricultural areas of the US. How much larger I think we'd have to figure out with the general equilibrium modeling. Uh, let me just say that um, one of the other themes I want to emphasize is that we could make much more complex models. Is anybody familiar with the INVEST system? Show of hands, have you ever heard of the INVEST system of models, natural capital project, Stanford University? Yeah. 
Okay, so there is this suite of models that is made available by, by a project. It's a joint venture between uh, Stanford University, University of Minnesota, and Nature Conservancy, I believe, and WWF, I believe. Anyway, a consortium that makes a suite of models available to estimate the value of ecosystem services, or at least the, uh, the hydrological and biological attributes of ecosystem services. Now, an interesting question is, how much do we gain by, the data, by fulfilling the data requirements of using much more complex models. This is one page of the documentation of the invest modeling for uh, sediment control. You will notice that that is equation number 45 uh, in the invest modeling documentation. So how important is it to do it in detail? Well, you also will find in the invest model documentation, a description of this similar in many respects, I think, to what I just described. I said, let's suppose that there's land use uh, at an upland area, which is going to result in gross transport or transport of a gross load of pollution of a certain amount. It's going to pass through an area of retained natural vegetation. And it's going to go into a stream where we have a, uh, a societal interest in reducing the load of pollution reaching it. Well, how much do you add by, by putting in more details there? I guess it depends on the purposes you wanna serve. Certainly, if you have a more granular depiction of the landscape, you might be able to describe exactly where you want riparian buffers to go. You might want them on more on some steeper slopes or more on some soil types, less than others. Whether or not it's worth going into the, the great detail, I guess is, is an open question. But at the end of the day, the principle is still the same. And the principle is that the marginal value, the value of the marginal meter of riparian buffer is going to be determined by how much do you value or how much do you want to avoid the cost of the pollution that's being charged? How much, what fraction of the pollution flow is last meter reducing? And then critically, when the pollution flow reaches last meter, how much of it is left? And again, the value of the marginal hectare of land, regardless of how good it is at removing pollution, is going to be zero with regard to the pollution removal function if there, there is no pollution to be removed. So again, we have to think through these factors. Uh, gosh, I have spent about the hour uh, on model number one, I haven't gotten to model number two yet, haven't nearly gotten to pollination yet. So let me just tease uh, what I would like to talk about in the final lecture. <laughs> I may end up talking really fast in the final hour. But what I want to talk about in the final lecture is the idea of coastal protection. This is, as you probably recognize, a cyclone approaching uh, the east coast of the Bay of Bengal. I'm not sure which cyclone this was, if it was the huge cyclone in 1999 or one of the later ones, but when it hit the coast, it had uh, severe damage or severe consequences as observed or as depicted there. Now you see one paltry row of palm trees being whipped in the wind. And the question arises, well, what if they had maintained more of the natural vegetation along that coast? What if instead of having the paltry, one paltry row of palm trees there, they had maintained the natural mangrove forests, which exists along much of the coast of India and other tropical nations? Well, those mangrove forests would have reduced the intensity of the wind, would have reduced the height and the energy of the waves, and potentially would have reduced the amount of devastation, property loss, and lives lost in events like that. So next time, since we're at the top of the hour now, I'll talk about ecosystem service models related to main maintaining vegetation for coastal protection. And with that, I will uh, end my, uh, my planned remarks and ask if there's any questions or discussion. <laughs>